know that all of you are pretty tired and it's been a long day. But I would just like to take a very short amount of time to tell you some of the things I feel after today's symposium. Yesterday, we spent 13 hours, the six of us, to get on a plane in Beijing and fly to Washington. On the plane, I saw the rivers, oceans, and the land, and I saw cities, I saw villages, I saw countryside, and I had a lot of feelings while I was seeing all those things. I came halfway around the world, and I saw all different types of uh, lifestyles along the way. But what I was thinking is, it doesn't matter what your skin color is, what language you speak, where you live, it doesn't matter. We're all humankind. Um, emotionally and physically, we are all structured the same way. We're all built the same way so we can communicate with each other. Just now, we were talking about who created the world. There was a gentleman in the back who talked about that. It doesn't matter who created the world. The world has a lot of living beings on it, all different kinds. And humankind is just one of those beings. The bodies of humans are not even considered strong compared to other animals. A lot of other animals are a lot stronger than we are. In the animal kingdom, we're not the strongest animals. We can't live in a very high temperature environment. And we're also not, we don't reproduce as well as other animals. You know, we're mammals, so we can only have one child per year. But. We, as humankind, are the most developed of any other animal. We're the leader. We're the top best of all life forms because other types of life forms don't have a lot of the characteristics that we have. First of all, people can communicate and talk and communicate and work together. Uh, an individual person is weak, but working together with the whole society in a community, a person becomes strong. The society becomes strong. That's because we can work together and cooperate. And so that is the reason that we stand out among all the other life forms. And number two, we can produce uh, tools used for our labor. And we can use those tools and upgrade them and get newer and better tools as we go along. That is technical innovation and technical progress, technological progress. I think because of the fact that we can communicate and exchange and work together, and because we can have technological progress and innovation, that's the only reason that we have today, that we have the world that we have today. Today, we use an entire day to talk about those things, cooperation, exchange, as well as innovation and progress. So we don't, we, it wasn't a long day. It was just one day, but it was very meaningful. I personally think that cooperation and exchange between people and innovation is not enough. We should do more. In the world that we live in, there is more and more cooperation as time goes by, but there are also a lot of struggles and confrontations and people killing each other, and that has not gone away, and it even, hasn't even lessened. We have progress in science and technology, and it has helped us do a lot of things like fly and airplanes, and our lives are longer than they used to be. But we still cannot solve some of the problems. They still exist just as they used to, and so a lot of the problems are not solved yet. A lot of big, major problems, actually, that exist in the world today have still not shown any progress. Like even in research, we, we want to think about the, the whole universe, the whole structure of the universe. We're not exactly sure. We haven't figured that out yet. Specifically speaking, in terms of natural disasters, we still have not figured out how to face those disasters completely. We know that a couple years ago in Sichuan, we saw that huge earthquake that killed so many people. And um, a few years back, the hurricane in the United States also 
brought a lot of people's uh, loss in both in life and in their assets. So we can do a lot to save people, to use our power to face maybe a natural disaster on the smaller scale, but for a bigger natural disaster, we are so incapable. And we also see the problem, the nuclear crisis in Japan, using so much energy, uh, nuclear energy around the world. Can we really control it? Once there is a problem, can we really uh, solve that? Maybe not. And we also have all these diseases, epidemics, around the world that haven't really been solved yet. We spend so much money and time and energy into saving our people, but that is probably still lagging behind compared to our defense spending. So I think that we still need to make progress. Why do I say this? Why do I emphasize the exchange and communication between our people? We talk about technological innovation, and we talk about it as a culture. I think that for us human beings, we have to first sit down and look at the fact that, OK, we are in faced with so many challenges, so many problems and issues and potential risks. How can we deal with those? For example, we watch a lot of Hollywood movies in China, and a lot of them talk about these huge scale natural disasters, for example, a comet hitting Earth or things like that. Well, if those things did happen. It's, it's possible that that would happen. What happens if that kind of thing indeed took, took place? Can we really circumvent our own uh, ideological thinking and sit down and really work this out together? Can we really do that? That is the major issue we are facing today. The United States is the most advanced and uh, the most prosperous country in the world and also the best innovator. So in this regard, I think people around the world are anticipating the United States. They are expecting the United States to, to continue to play the leading role. China is the country with the most population and the fastest growing country. And we're now the second largest economy in the world. It's only second to the United States. And traditionally speaking, Chinese people tend to think that we shoulder a certain responsibility. And um, so we probably are not completely capable now, but Chinese people are very concerned about the life of our planet and our responsibility in it. So starting from that point, China and the United States as the, the biggest countries in this world, how can we take the lead in working together in innovating in science and technology. I think this will be very helpful to solving all the major problems that we face today as human beings. This is very meaningful. The COSC and the Wilson Center are just two little organizations in our two respective countries. but. I believe that for us to sit down and uh, be a role model, I believe this is going to be useful. So lastly, I would like to express my gratitude to everybody here. I know you are all very concerned and you pay a lot of attention to the cooperation relationship between our two countries and uh, you are our friends. So I would like to thank you and also thank all the speakers 
who have provided very informative presentations and a lot of intelligence. Thank you all. And also, great thanks to the Kissinger Institute, uh, Ambassador Roy and uh, Mr. Spellman. Thank you both for your thoughtful arrangements for this symposium. I think this has been a very successful symposium. Thank you again. Uh, let me uh, echo some of uh, Chairman Wong's uh, comments. Uh, I think today's discussion uh, was an extremely fruitful one. I think it followed in the tradition of the other three symposia that we have held uh, with the Counselor's Office of the State Council. This has been a project which I started uh, trying to organize the whole series of four symposia that we've had. Uh, over three years ago, and it's been one of the most rewarding uh, projects that uh, I've been involved in uh, at the Kissinger Institute. Um, uh, and in that context, I'd like to thank the presenters on both sides. I think we all benefited greatly from their thoughtfulness, their expertise, which they brought to bear on these questions which they deal with professionally. Uh, uh, I was. Uh, I've seen the papers develop, and uh, now I see the presentations, and I think uh, we can be very thankful. I'd also like to thank you as an audience. Uh, I think the questions and the attention help stimulate the excellence of the presentations, if I may. Uh, so it was really a group effort among all of us here. Uh, let me just make a couple of comments. Um, I think one of the central accomplishments of this kind of a symposium is to increase understanding across this cultural barrier. It's not as deep, perhaps, as the valley of death that we were talking about <laughs> earlier, but it is a gap between China and America, uh, and I think this kind of discussion helps to uh, uh, lessen that gap, shorten that distance. Um, we found out today, I think, that we have many similarities in the way that we uh, pursue innovation. We have differences. And I think that's to be expected, but I think by better understanding both those similarities and differences, we can uh, 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 help in the way that we get along together, frankly. We've looked at some difficult issues. Uh, IPR uh, protection, uh, technology transfer from the American side are things that we are concerned about in our S&T relationship with China. Um, on the other hand, from the Chinese side, our export control system, uh, our uh, general suspicion in some parts of our society about China's intentions, these are difficulties. These won't go away tomorrow as a result of our discussions, <coughs> but we may be able to better understand them and manage them, which is what has to happen. Uh, many problems you can't solve right away. You have to find ways to uh, intelligently and sympathetically manage those problems. And I hope that discussions today would help not just those of us who were involved in planning or presenting, but in listening today. Um, the last thing I'd say is we've talked today about how the relationship between the United States and China is one which encompasses both competition and cooperation. Uh, I think this is inevitable, and what I would hope is that the cooperation would flourish and the competition would be healthy. You know, you can have healthy competition where you don't try to best the other one. It's not a zero sum, but the competition improves both sides. That, of course, is something that we believe quite deeply in, uh, in the United States, that competition can be a good thing. And the trick is not to eliminate competition, but to make it serve positive ends. Uh, on, on both sides. And uh, in the broader U.S.-China relationship today, there are many aspects of mistrust, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. uh, and I hope that the S&T relationship can successfully marry competition and collaboration and therefore not add to that mistrust, but can reduce the mistrust. That mm -hmm we feel in, in other areas, because this relationship, as we all know, 
and is frequently mentioned, is really, if not the most important, certainly one of, one of the most important relationships uh, in the world today. So we both sides have a great responsibility to try to manage it well and to reduce frictions and to increase positive uh, interaction. So I thank you all. I thank you particularly. Uh, this is a very uh, gratifying project, and I'm uh, uh, privileged and, uh, and delighted to have been a part of it. And uh, thank you all.